Check the forty show. Check the forty show, yeah. Check the forty show, yeah. Check the forty show, Why you acting all guided? This ain't a pod. This a pod. We are back. Welcome to another episode of the Fantasy Forty Podcast. We are previewing week seven already. So the season's flying by. Our week six preview has been lost into cyberspace. We did an episode, but it uh, had some technical difficulties. We could not get it loaded and up on all the places where you can find our typical fantasy goodness. On the plus side, as we were talking before we started recording, boy, did we have a terrible week six preview. So it's probably for the best that that thing's lost because all our predictions and projections were absolute dog shit. So on to week seven. We are nothing if not self-deprecating, and there was probably a reason why that recording never wanted to see the light of day, no matter how many times I tried to convert it. And like you said before we went live, you were kind enough to look back on the YouTube video and uh, count our hits and misses, so we will not have that episode either this week, because Jesus Christ, what did we bat? Uh, 080 uh, on the week. It was not the prettiest thing. Took an L on Alexander Madison because so did the entire fantasy football league. Mark Andrews was supposed to have the art, the tight end one week because he played against the Eagles. And of course he did absolutely nothing. The, the obvious ones that we really went hard on came crashing down upon us. So yes, let's forget about week six and let's move forward to this interesting week seven. Cause truthfully week six sucked almost across the board. It wasn't good football. There wasn't, there was, there was, of course, some breakout performances and some comeback performances. But I, by and large, I, I was left wanting more on a lot of my dynasty teams. I suspect this week is going to be more of the same. Just a quick glance at the schedule and looking at point totals. Five teams are not even projected to score 21 points this week, and not a single team is projected to score over 30. So wow. the, the by the numbers, this is not going to be a very good week either. Yeah, yeah well, not a great start, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll forge on. I mean, let's just start the teams on the bye. Colts, Dolphins, Ravens, and Vikings. So there's some fantasy heavy hitters in there in different uh, offensive skill positions. But of those four teams, there's one breaking news item that we should probably touch on. I don't know if you saw it because it literally just crossed my phone in the last 10 minutes. And it's coming out of said by the Miami Dolphins have named Tua Tagovailoa their starting quarterback for the remainder of the season. Well, this was kind of the talk before the year that he was actually might get the start last week was like people looking at the schedule because I'm not mistaken. They went Jets by back to the Jets after the bye in week eight. Huh? So the, Kind of gives him a chance to, uh, you know, haha, Tua. Gives Tua a chance to uh, kind of see the same defense twice and prep for it. You know what I mean? So it's probably the best case scenario for him. They just played him. They kind of know schematically what they're going to do. So you get the bye week to prepare based on what you saw last week. It's probably the best spot for him to be. And it might worked out great for me in one of my main home leagues because I – had Russ Wilson and Fitzpatrick, so I just needed him to hang on to week six through Russ, Russ's bye, and he did it for me. So breathe, breathe, breath of fresh air. Oh, thank God I got the one week out of him. Good for you. And Fitzpatrick did not look that great, even in a 24 nothing win against the Jets um, going into said bye. So not a total shocker, but they come out of the bye versus Rams at Cardinals versus Chargers at Broncos. Then they get the at Jets. So not a murderer's row, but not the easiest slate. I mean, you're getting Aaron Donald uh, introducing you to the NFL coming out of your bye. At least they are at home. Then they should be in some some shootouts potentially against those Cardinals and Chargers uh, in the following week. So I am excited. I traded for two in one of my super flex leagues and didn't give up too much for him. Was looking more towards the future because I still have Wentz and – I think Matt Ryan in the league that I traded for Tua, so I, was, I don't even need him for this year. But I am excited to see what this young man can do because I think at three and three, the Dolphins would qualify as overachievers thus far in the AFC East. Yeah, and I, I mean, I 
football aside, I like him. I just like watch some videos of him. Like uh, I, I shared it with you before in another thread, watching Haskins spend his first contract money, and then I watched the one of Tua doing it, and it just is totally different. Two is like, yeah, I saved all my contract money. I was able to live off any endorsements I got. So that money's just going in the bank. And he bought like a normal car. He bought, he bought like a $40,000 car mm. and his house was expensive, but he's in South Florida. So it's not crazy. But then compared to Haskins, where Haskins, I think, spent something like 360 bucks on jewel, 360,000 on jewelry. And you're like, oh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tool fan. Yeah. A, a tale of two quarterbacks right there. And yeah, you saw the two, it came back out and FaceTimed his family as he was sitting at the spot where I think he got his yep. first NFL snap. Like dude, just wired differently. Like he, he loves football and you know, it's a shame for the injuries because had it not been for those injuries, he had been starting week one. Just like Barrow would, it would have been well, nice. Uh, could have been drafted, and could have been for the, could have been the Bengals quarterback. Even he certainly could have. Um, you know, while I still love Barrow, we're seeing some limitations um, in young Joe Barrow. But he said the same thing. Barrow said, "I'll live off my endorsement money. I'm not touching my contracts because I should never have to." And uh, just wiser, intelligent individuals who will be. <laughs> set for life and subsequent lives thereafter um, by doing so. But now excited to see what Tua does start next week. But it is this week. Uh, We just buttoned up another double Monday night football, Monday afternoon and Monday night football game. Neither were that good in my humble opinion. I mean, the weather played a part in the Buffalo game, but Clyde Edwards Hilaire was running rough shot all over those Buffalo Bills. Maybe he had a little Le'Veon Bell fire lit under his ass. The second game, predictably, was a Cardinal slaughter of the Dallas Cowboys. And it just seems Zeke's fumbling, two fumbles in a game. He's never even done that in college. And he can't even do any. But it didn't go the way we thought. We thought Arizona would would win that one. But, like, we we were projecting it to be a monster passing game because that – Dallas secondary is trash. It ended up being a Kenyon Drake game, and Hopkins was almost phased out. I think he had two catches. He, he did somehow still for 73 yards on those two yeah. catches, but still led the team with eight targets. And I watched that through halftime, and I saw highlights this morning, and it looked like the Cowboys were playing a don't give up the big pass defense. And that's clearly – it was it – was, a focus of the Cardinals were trying to take shots. They tried to take a couple deep shots with Isabella. They tried to take some deep shots with Nuke. So uh, I just think it didn't blend that Cowboys were playing scared prevent defense early on to keep everything in front of them. And the Cardinals were still trying to take shots rather than adapting. So yeah, it, it wasn't the, it wasn't the manner in which we saw it, but 38 to 10 is still 38 to 10, even with a, junk rushing touchdown at the very end when Kenny Drake shouldn't even have been in the game that he busts one up the gut for 69 yards on third down when they're just trying to run out the clock. So kudos to anyone who continued to ride that Kenyon Drake lightning because he sure rewarded you as what probably the RB2 performance, I would assume, behind Kenyon, behind uh, Derrick Henry for for week six was probably Kenyon Drake with that 160-whatever and two touchdowns. So probably good for him, but we're not here to live in the past. We're here to live in the present and it's Tuesday, John. So I'm going to give you the opportunity. Are we going to talk about Thursday night football? Let's do it. Cause it's a stinker. <laughs> I, like I said, this whole week, I think stinks. So it's a perfect start last week. Having no Thursday football is a little early Christmas present for me. Cause I hate Thursday night football. So that Brought a smile to my face, and as it comes back, it's a dog shit game, and it makes me happy that it sucks already. I wonder what the weather was supposed to be like in Buffalo on Thursday night, because that's when that Kansas City Buffalo game was supposed to be played, because it was rainy and cold, and I do think that had some impact on the overall quality of the game. And just remember, Buffalo, your weather's going to suck eventually, whether you like it or not. So all those fantasy assets are going to start being regressed a little bit if you think that josh allen's cutting through the snow in northern new york in december uh when you fantasy championships i think you'll be sadly mistaken they will become a great conservative and run based eventually so get your josh allen points when you can but again not want to talk about the past let's talk about the current thursday night football is the new york giants the one in five new york giants head to my backyard, Lincoln Financial Field, to do battle with the 1-4-1 one, one, Philadelphia <laughs> Eagles. What do you got? 
Vomit. That's what I got. Lowest total on the board uh, for this week, 43 and a half. Philly's a small home favorite, three and a half. Two of the lower scoring teams on the board this week. Uh, Giants are looking at 19.75, and the Eagles are looking at 23.75. Uh, you, you know my thing. I'm, I fade Thursday when I can, and this is a perfect opportunity to fade it. Uh, Slayton's probably in play for the Giants. That's it on that side of the ball. Um, Phillies has done a poor job against tight end, so if you're desperate, Ingram might be able to get in the end zone here for Philly. Uh, Miles Sanders is out. Good luck with anybody else. This is uh, it's, it's as shitty as a game as it appears to be. Hard to argue. I know that Darius Slayton got <laughs> hurt in, in, in the game last week, so I just was looking up something very quickly to see if I saw him a, limping, but I didn't know how bad yeah, it was. If there was anything more to see here, but Darius Slay is going to get Darius. Sorry, Darius Slayton is going to get Darius Slay in this game because there is literally nothing else in that passing attack to be afraid of. So You missed the cornball joke in there. Well, Darius sl- Slayton is going to get Darius Slay a ton in this game. Oh, oh, oh. So disappointed in myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm disappointed in myself. What you said. Um, so I, I wouldn't be expecting fireworks. The Eagle skill position players this week are going to be Fulgham Ward, J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, Richard Rogers, Jason Kroom, Boston Scott, and Corey Clement. I said the Eagles' skill position players are going to be those those fine, sure, I'm sure fine young gentlemen, sure to J.J. Arcega Whiteside, who stinks, caught a, he recovered a fumble touchdown from Miles Sanders, and it's going to be his career high in points in an NFL game from fantasy. But you're going to fire off Fulgham again because he's getting all the targets from – you have to. He's a must-start right now, uh, even though you hate Thursday Night Football. And I would err on the side of Boston Scott over Corey Clement. We we experienced this week one, but Boston Scott was also a little dinged up and ended up in negative game script against those Washington football teams. So I think Boston Scott could be in for a decent game here, especially in PPR. Him and Fulgham are all I'm starting. I would be comfortable starting Carson Wentz um, in a pinch if you had someone on a bye week. But the Giants haven't been terrible, and with that low total, I'm not crazy about it. Like you mentioned on the Giants side, I proceed with caution with Slay Ingram. Sorry, I'm done. I just sure he should be the he should be the guy, but he just hasn't all year. He's just been a, a, a epic disappointment. And somehow the Eagles contained uh, Mark Andrews. They did give up a touchdown to Nick Boyle, but they, you know, Mark Andrews did not have the game. I think all of fantasy football had assumed he was going to have against these Eagles. So I'm just not going to. Go right back to the well with Evan Ingram. I'm sure he should not trust in Danny Dimes because even in game scripts and high-scoring affairs, he just isn't racking up fancy points right now. And the Eagles' run defense is still pretty stout, so I don't, <laughs> I never think and don't think in this instance that Devonta Freeman is startable, even in PPR. I would look for other options. The best news out of this game is it should suck, and if it sucks, I think we're seeing a pretty good buy-now window for Carson Wentz in Dynasty. His price yeah. just it has to keep dropping every week as, as, he, as he and his offense are just sputtering. Sputtering is an understatement, and I agree with you. I'm still fully on board. This isn't Wentz's fault. You want to you see these Jalen Hurts packages going out there, and of course the dude's a, a running quarterback. I mean, so of course he's going to look good. He's running on an option offense. It's totally different than what Wentz is doing, but it's, it doesn't mean get Wentz out there. This this is Hurts' time, and I'm with you because this Giants game, then we get home against the Cowboys. Eagles get a bye week, so hopefully getting a little healthy, get Goddard back. Hopefully Sanders is back after that. It doesn't sound like Hurts is going to be back. They think Hurts is a more significant injury. Um, Jalen Rager, Deshaun Jackson, Alshon Jeffrey, I mean, whatever they can contribute is better than – J.J. Ortega Whiteside, you know, and and John Hightower dropping bombs that Carson Wentz is putting right in his bread basket. Like, better days are ahead for Wentz. And coming out of that by at Giants, at Browns, versus Seahawks, at Packers. Yes, yes, I, I'm very interested in, in that four-game run for Carson Wentz in weeks 10 through 13 to get you into the fantasy playoffs. So, like it. I will be watching, John, because I am an Eagles homer, if nothing else, and who knows? We win this game. We could be in first place again in the division after this week because let's move on to Sunday. And the first game on the slate for Sunday is the floundering two and four 
current division leading Dallas Cowboys head to FedEx Field to do battle with the one in five Washington football team. Boy. Yeah, staying staying in this. <laughs> I, I can't let's, let's just get it out of the way, John. Six, six, nine, and one is winning this division. The NFC That's least. My- should be uh, good for fantasy. Forty-seven and a half points. Uh, Dallas is only a one-point favorite on the road, so it should be close. Should be a bit of a shootout between both of them. The Washington football team is projected at twenty-two. Dallas at twenty-four. So should be six-ish touchdowns to be had here. Where they go, nobody knows. Uh, that Washington backfield is getting more muddled. Barber's getting more work again. McKissick's been a steady contributor, which is. I don't want to say shocking, but un- unforeseen. Gibson isn't getting the work like he was kind of trending upwards. So good luck there. I do like McLaurin in this one. Hopefully, I, I would like them more with Alex Smith, to be honest, than Kyle Allen. So there's some mystery there. Who- yeah, exactly. Um, then switching over to Dallas. I mean, obviously, we know we know the names in Dallas. You know who you're going to play there. So Do you? I mean, I mean, yeah. they got Cooper some garbage time, but I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Lamb's the steadiest. Cooper, obviously, if if you have him, you know you're getting zero or you know twenty five. So you you roll the dice on that. Gallup has kind of vanished. Schultz still had a decent game with Dalton there, and and I I'd be okay playing Dalton here too. So. But you you play the names, and obviously you have Zeke in the backfield for Dallas. Uh, uh, Fumbletron, good old good old Zeke. Uh, look at like look at like dog shit <laughs> without Dak handing on the ball. Fifty four attempts by Andy Dalton in this game when they were chasing points early and often against those Cardinals, and that led to ten targets each for Cooper and Lamb, a team leading eleven for Zeke because it was literally just a dump off fest. The Dallas Cowboys have now officially lost their entire offensive line. They're just, they just can't let the Eagles have anything for themselves. So we lost four or five offensive line starters. They finally just shelved Nick Martin. So they went full backups and they're all young kids too. They, they don't know which side is up right now. And the sky is falling in Dallas. I don't care when they get their defensive starters back. This season is, is kaput. The Washington football team beats Dallas at home. (laughs) So they go to dueling two and five records here. That same Washington run defense is allowing what I deem a robust 5.1 yards per carry. And I said, and we just discussed that Kenyon Drake just gashed them on Monday night football. So did Kyler Murray, but Kyler Murray's slightly different breed than Kyle Allen. I I will say, even though pretty sure didn't one take another's job somewhere. I feel like that was a thing. I thought Kyle Allen took Kyler Murray's job. Did I totally make this up? I think so. And that's why he transferred. Wasn't Kyler Murray at Texas A&M and he transferred to Oklahoma? There, there's a hand last year. You're, you're not far off. There's a handful of guys that bounced around. And- I'm going to have to fact check this. I, I feel like that was a storyline last year if the Cardinals played the Carolina Panthers while Kyle Allen was the starter there. I think it ought not that I'll, yeah, I'm going to be wrong there. But there's a regardless. couple of guys that have kind of gone through that weird circle. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and you you mentioned McKissick. McKissick is in PPR has been very startable these last couple of weeks, and yeah. he yeah. he's not going away, which is unfortunate for us Antonio Gibson enthusiasts because he's still involved in the offense, but in a full timeshare uh, with McKissick. So one of those guys is going to pop off in, in this game and be a high-end RB2 in PPR. It's just a matter of who gets the touchdown because they're, they're still getting a decent amount of passing down work, but McKissick has just been consistent. I think it's like six catches in two or the last three games. So yeah, like in both of those guys, you mentioned McLaurin. He saw 28.5% of Kyle Allen's targets in this last game, and that should persist against this beatable Dallas secondary. Logan Thomas also caught a touchdown on his four targets, turned him into four catches, I think, for 32 yards. He's another guy I would run back if you're in the need, if you're in the market for tight end because Dallas is is not the greatest at covering said tight ends. On the Dallas side, like you said, I'm trusting Zeke, and then you see that Cooper and Lamb are the ones that are going to get the volume. It's not Gallup. It's not going to be Gallup for the rest of this year. You can start Dalton Schultz if you're in a pinch, but I believe – 
this is going to be a lower scoring affair, all things being considered. I don't recall what you said. The total 47 and a half is a small game. I, Dallas does not want Andy Dalton throwing it 52 times. Dallas wants Andy Dalton has thrown it less than 30 times in this game. So it is, you're going to get back to Zeke. It's a trust Zeke game after his fumbles. They're going to run him till the wheels fall off. Maybe get a little sprinkling of Pollard, who did look good in his limited opportunities when they when they sat Zeke down for his, his fumblies uh, against these Cardinals. But as I stated, I like Washington in this game at home, and I do think they win. Um, it's got a better defense, and Dallas offense is no bueno. We mentioned them losing their entire offensive line in Washington's strength is their fucking eight-man rotation at <laughs> – defensive line so you know it's a typical strength against weakness matchup they they should be giving them problems all day agreed all right moving on to thank the god <laughs> four and two got pantsed by the pittsburgh steelers cleveland browns head to paul brown stadium staying in state battle of ohio 2.0 to face off against the one four and one cincinnati barrows we said it last week. That was predictable. Pittsburgh is very, very good. Cleveland is not. So they, they were going to take a beating there. I know that I saw a little bit on Twitter this morning, the old Cleveland sky is falling stuff, but I think they're in a spot to get right here. Total 51. Cleveland's a three-point road favorite. So the Browns are looking at 27, almost 28 points in this game, while the Bengals are looking at 23. I think they win this one pretty easily. I think they're a better team. I think they're better coached. I like the Browns. I, I I wish they were totally healthy. I think Mayfield's still a little banged up. So's Beckham. So's Landry. So playing with caution. Um, and Joku came back last week. There was some report of him asking to be traded again. Then he came out on Twitter and said, "I didn't say any of that." So he, he, can he say some of that? Because they should trade him. He deserves better than being in a rotation behind Hooper with Harrison Bryant. True, but my my larger point was the last time I remember him getting some press, they ended up featuring him a little more. So I, I like Njoko as kind of a sneaky tight end play this week that's totally off the radar. But, I mean, you know, it's a sleeper play. I wouldn't plug him in if you have somebody <laughs> better or available. On the Cincinnati side, we saw some pretty – Big fantasy games from them in the last couple of weeks. Uh, T. Higgins had a decent game last week. AJ AJ Green came back from the dead a bit the prior week. Uh, Mixon finally went off. So it's kind of Russian roulette here. Which who do you trust? So th- th- there should be points here. So good good luck picking who it's going to be. I don't trust AJ Green to do it two weeks in a row, but he's another sleeper targety kind of guy. Higgins seems to be emerging, so he's probably playable. And if you have Burrow or Mixon, obviously you're going to use him. Well, I know Mixon's a little dinged up as well. He came back to that game, but we saw a lot of Gio Bernard again. And let's hark him back. You were, you were shitting on Thursday Night Football uh, earlier in this episode. And week two was these Bengals heading to uh, play, face the Browns 30-35 to 35 final in that shootout on Thursday night, which was – Run heavy by the Browns. Nick Chubb had 124 yards and two touchdowns. Kareem Hunt had another 86 and one, and then he had 15 and one receiving. So it wasn't a big passing day from Baker, 219, two and one. But Barrow, 316 and three, because you can't run on the Browns. Just remind you, you do not run on these Browns. So even if Mixon plays, temper expectations. If he doesn't, Gio is a fine, flexible running back because whenever Gio gets a starting nod, somehow he volumes his way into production. But yeah, some of these pass catchers did well in those games. And the Drew Sample Ozuma tag team, because it's the game Ozuma went down, had 11 catches for 87 yards against these Browns. I think they see something that they can exploit underneath, maybe in the linebackers. No more Ozuma. Maybe this is a Drew Sample game. I'm not going to the well for that guy because he laid an egg in a, in a recent spot where I was promoting him. But I do think there's something to be said for Drew Sample here. I'm going to call for another 302 from Barrow, and I am going to say A.J. Green touchdown dance uh, against these Cleveland Browns who you could throw all over on. So he should be in line for a big game. I like T. Higgins as well. That kid's impressed me more than I thought coming yeah. out. Um, and it should be a cream hunt bounce back game as well. He had 60% of the carries in that blowout against Pittsburgh. He's going to see more than that in this game. And Cincinnati 
does not put up much of a fight um, in the running game. So I, I do like a huge Kareem Hunt bounce back game. Limit expectations on Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry because it could be a similar game script where Baker's only thrown it 20, 25 times. Yeah, it could be. You mentioned tight end against the Browns. They're giving up 9.3 fantasy points per week to a tight end. And conversely, the Bengals are giving up 10.4. So I, tight ends are in play in this one. Yeah, I mean Hooper has been more of a more involved in their offense, so I I would feel comfortable trusting him on the Cleveland side and Cincinnati. Literally, that's all they have is sample. I mean, I think what Seething Carter is their other tight end, and that should never be a thing. So maybe 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 Drew Samuels is the best play. <laughs> Moving on, this game should be fireworks, but it also Uh-oh is a, <laughs> the combined record of three and eight between these two teams. So we have the two and three Detroit Lions heading to Mercedes-Benz Stadium to face off against the one and five Atlanta Falcons. I just want to know, starting this week, all these games suck. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first one that at least gets you interested. I'm doubling down. I said last week I had Detroit should never be winning on the road. They haven't in a decade. They ended up pulling off the win on the road last week. They're not doing it two weeks in a row. Atlanta looked a little inspired now that their beloved coach is scrounging on the streets for change. Uh, so I, I think Detroit goes to Atlanta. And I, I wouldn't be shocked to see Atlanta smoke them. Atlanta's a two-and-a-half point favorite at home. Totals 56-and-a-half, 57 in some places. So they're projecting some fireworks here. Detroit's looking at roughly 28 points. And the Falcons are looking at 29, one of the highest scoring teams on the board this week. Uh, I agree with kind of what you led with, which there there should be some points here. So, you know, it, it, kind of going on the same road with a couple of these teams. The, there's a pretty narrow fantasy tree of distribution. So Atlanta, you're going to play Gurley. You're going to play Julio, who got in the end zone twice last week. Ridley's obviously a, someone you could look at here. Detroit, on the other hand, I think, Swift kind of had a bit of a coming out party finally last week. He had a nice game. And Atlanta has been horrific for two or three years against stopping pass catching running backs. So if, if Swift is getting all that uh, passing game work, he's somebody I'm really interested in this week, even for DFS. I think he's super playable. I think he's in line for good game. Of course, the fantasy gods hate people and it'll probably end up being carrying on Johnson. But is what it is. You're playing Galladay. You're playing Stafford. The, this game should be a shootout, but I think Atlanta beats them pretty easily towards the end there. Yeah, Atlanta ringing up their first victory of the season in an odd way. They 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 scored ten points in every quarter. I don't know that I've ever seen that before. They're 10, hmm. 10, 10, 10, 140 to twenty three. Just balanced by those Atlanta Falcons. But what what Atlanta they they they're good at stopping the run. But I agree, they're bad at stopping pass catching running backs. The Lions. Almost averaging almost five yards per carry allowed and seven rushing touchdowns on the season. So uh, should be a girly spot, but Gurley had 20 carries against the Vikings who aren't a good run defense, and he mustered a sterling 47 yards in that. Was a little bit more involved in the passing game, had three for 20 receiving, which was necessary, but we see what the floor of Gurley can be, and he's a touchdown-dependent running back. When he doesn't get the touchdowns, he's not getting you to 100 all-purpose yards anymore. So proceed with caution uh, as far as that is concerned. I will say that I trust Kenny Galladay and Julio Jones smash spots, 150 and one touchdown each. Oh, I like it. In in a shootout, Calvin Ridley, I think left the game injured, um, which is what led to his more modest day, even though he still had six or 61 and a touchdown, but Russell Gage four for 65. And we might see a little more your boy, Olamide Zacchaeus, uh, I'll never, at, I'll never get it. Never. <laughs> but uh, check on the status of Ridley because it should be a firefight. And I agree, I would be taking Atlanta at home here because I'm not trusting either of their defenses. And if a healthy Julio is what unlocks this Atlanta offense, well, he sure shit looked healthy <laughs> this past week against the Vikings in Detroit. Is it much more formidable, even with a coot on the outside? So. Uh, and I also think this is a spot where you should be able to fire up both of these quarterbacks. They both should be in line for 300 plus passing yards, two plus passing touchdowns on the week. What should be another interesting fantasy day? The Green Bay Packers, four and one, got their 
dicks kicked in by Tampa <laughs> Bay. Dominic and Sue is still sacking Aaron Rodgers all the way back <laughs> to Green Bay. Head to Houston Energy Stadium to face off against the one and five Houston Texans. Should be a get right spot for the Packers here, right? On paper. Uh, total 56 and a half. Packers, three and a half point favorite on the road. Packers are actually projected to be the highest scoring team this week at tw- tied for first, 29.75. So just under that 30 spot. While the awful Texans are looking at 26, which is a little high for my liking, to be honest. So I think the Packers, looking from a gambling standpoint, I think the Packers cover this easy on the road. Um, Aaron Jones kind of got bottled up, but they had a tough tough run defense. We thought he'd get a little more work in the passing game going into that game. So I think Aaron Jones bounces back. Aaron Rodgers is going to be Aaron Rodgers. They're going to force feed Devontae Adams. Those are the only three guys I trust for Green Bay. Tanyan got a little banged up, but I think he's fine, but I'm not trusting him here. On the Houston side, if you have Deshaun Watson, you're playing him. They're force feeding uh, David Johnson the football. So he's kind of sprung back to life for fantasy purposes. At wide receiver, I, I don't trust – you just can't trust any of these guys week in and week out. So I, they scare the shit out of me. If I have other options, I will plug them in. But obviously, we've seen it. Fuller can have huge games. So can Cooks. So can, you know, everybody on that team. They, you know, even Kenny Stills, who hasn't done shit this year. He's going to have a game this year where he has, you know, two touchdowns on three receptions for 130 yards. So – that they're just too hit or miss for me at wide receiver. Yeah, but uh, these same Green Bay Packers allowing 70% completion on the season, uh, only 7.7 yards per attempt, but uh, yielded nine passing touchdowns, only have two interceptions on the season. So they let you catch the ball, and then they tackle you, it seems like. But they, they're not intercepting it. They're not really stopping people from catching passes. You know that's what the Texans are going to want to do at home. So this should be another Deshaun Watson spot of 300 and potentially three touchdowns. Should bring a little bit with his legs uh, as well. To your point, Aaron Jones, get, get right game. I think after week one, we said Aaron Jones week two was a get right game, and we were a little light on that. Uh, Houston run defense is allowing four, 5.4 yards per carry on the season that that's not a run defense that that is a get run on defense and yeah you you said it's get right you know all is right with the world with green bay i'm surprised that houston is only getting three and a half points in this game i don't know if that's more insulting to green bay or more confusing after what i've seen the houston texans not accomplish this season i don't care that they're at home um aaron jones get right game 102 touchdowns uh for these green bay packers might see a little bit more Jamal Williams and even uh, what's his name AJ Dillon than I had in than I would like in this one, but uh, on the Houston side, yeah, you're going to fire up Will Fuller. You probably should go back to the well with Brandon Cooks. Yeah, you're going to be starting uh, DJ. It sounds like the the Jordan Aikens concussion is a little bit worse than uh, I don't want to say a normal concussion. I'm not trying to belittle the point, but he he missed a, he had already missed the week prior with the concussion or left the game and fells just went out and did Darren Fells things, catches yeah. a ton of passes and a touchdown. And if he's if he's a starter again with no Aikens, I will have Darren Fells in every single DFS lineup because when he's the guy, he is guaranteed a touchdown. So Darren Fells is a starting tight end. Darren Fells is my starting tight end. But Green Bay is going to throttle them in a get-right game. Yeah, this is actually I, – I, I like blowout games. This is so far the most likely blowout in my opinion. I mean, after what we witnessed Green Bay experience <laughs> down in Tampa Bay, they they need it. Um, and if there's ever a team that's willing to allow you to do whatever you want on offense, <laughs> it's the Houston Texans. <laughs> All right. Listen, uh, headline game for the week. Battle of the undefeated. Someone's own must go. All that cliche shit. The 5-0. and Pittsburgh Steelers head to Nissan Stadium to face off against somehow playing into this us against the world mentality, Tennessee Titans. Yeah. So Pittsburgh's two and a half point road favorite, total of 52 and a half. Um, going back to the well on this one, I'm taking the under. Uh, both teams are very, very sound defensively. So 52 is pretty crazy. I mean, I know they've both been able to to put up points on the offensive side of the ball, but 
these are two of the better defenses in football. So Pittsburgh's 26. Um, so they're, they're expecting it to be close, but yeah, I'm, I'm just not seeing, um, I'm just not seeing the fantasy points in this one. I think the defenses show up. And I think Tennessee's in a bad spot. They just lost Taylor the one Pittsburgh obviously is aware that they lost Taylor the one. And I would imagine that they're going to be, you know, targeting that side of the offensive line and trying to get some pressure on Tannehill. So I, I think this goes way under, but I think Pittsburgh wins pretty handily. I was not aware that they had lost Taylor Lewan. I was fully aware that the Pittsburgh run defense has lost Devin Bush, who is their signal caller. Taylor Lewan, torn ACL, same as Devin Bush. So big hits to both uh, of those positions. And it's interesting because the stats that I had is that this Pittsburgh run defense was allowing 66.2 yards per game through these first five weeks, while the Tennessee rush offense has averaged 157.8 yards per game through the same five weeks. So this is a strength on strength with each of their strengths compromised a little bit uh, with those two significant injuries. But I can also see a defensive battle breaking out here of the team just not wanting to make make the, the first mistake. But let's give credit where credit is due with Ryan Tannehill. That dude has been amazing. 364, four passing touchdowns, one interception. Didn't even run the ball once. Again, he just stayed in the pocket, picked them apart, and let Derrick Henry do all the running for the week. But Ryan Tannehill has been amazing. Uh, from a fantasy perspective, and you can throw on Pittsburgh. It's do they have the deep speed to leverage it? Because it looks like AJ Brown's been running a bunch of underneath shit. You now he just you know yak yak type plays rather than stretching the field. Do they get Corey Davis back? Do they get uh, Adam Humphreys more involved? He was six for sixty four yeah. in the game. Johnu Smith left injured with an ankle injury. Keep an eye on it because if he's out, Anthony Ferkser apparently is a thing. Eight for 113 and a touchdown. Now, Pittsburgh is a little stouter defense than those aforementioned Houston Texans, but I want the tight end that Ryan Tannehill is throwing passes to. Yep. So if Johnny Smith is out, John uh, Anthony Ferkser is 100% streamable from the tight end position. So outside of that, the Pittsburgh side of the house, you can't start Juju anymore. Juju's he's, he's benchable. They hate him. They're, they're literally just keeping him around in case of injury. Like They're not paying him. He's going elsewhere. It's unfortunate. To peck in order, it's it's Chase Claypool, then Deontay Johnson, then James Washington, then Juju. And that's not going to change. They are just manufacturing touches for Claypool. They're giving them sweeps, you know, in the red zone. They love this kid. They want they're th- this is what they sit up at night thinking about is ways to get Chase Claypool the ball more and Juju the ball less. And they have done a damn fine job of accomplishing that thus far. I also could think this could be a sneaky Eric Ebron game when it's all said and done. Uh, as one of those more lower scoring type affairs. Do you think they want Claypool involved or do you think he has been the beneficiary of Johnson being banged up? Because what are we, we're in week seven. They already had their bye, right? So they've played mm-hmm. well, they, yeah, five games. Week six, they played five games. Johnson's missed basically two and a half games. Do you know he is like one or two off the target lead on the team still? I believe it because in this game the, this past week where Pittsburgh throttled the Browns 38-7, to Big Ben threw it 22 times. It, it, had, it, had not, it was turnovers and then rushing touchdowns. They had three rushing touchdowns on the game. Claypool was their leading receiver, seven for 70, sorry, four for 74. James Washington, four for 68 and one. While Juju played the entire game, two for six, two for six. doesn't matter he threw it 22 times. I mean, the fact that Juju averaged three yards per catch. Well, on his on his two yeah. catches, it's just it's it's unfortunate. It's been a epic fall from grace for Juju. I do think better days are ahead. Buy low on Juju if you can, because he will get a contract elsewhere and he can shine in the right environment. It is just not Pittsburgh. I am sitting him this week for a variety uh, of options, and I wouldn't be too keen on wanting to roll out Big Ben uh, this week either. I don't know Deontay Johnson's status, but. I don't think he was real, real, remotely close to playing last week, so I would consider him questionable for this week. So it could be a James Washington DFS spot uh, as well because teams are going to start paying attention to Chase Claypool. Yeah. I kept trying to get him, uh, Johnson, this week. I knew he was hurt, and people were like, oh, when's this guy going to play again? I threw out an offer in almost every league I don't have him in for a second, which I think was fair. 
and nobody took it. Everybody declined. Yeah, I, if I had him, and I think I am in one or two spots, you know, I guess we don't share those leagues. I'm not trading him for a second either because I'm assuming your second's probably late and brighter days are ahead for anyone that's watching these Pittsburgh games where it's going to be Claypool and Deontay Johnson going forward. Um, and if Claypool is the alpha they think, I could actually benefit Deontay Johnson <laughs> rather, rather than hurt him because – Get Juju out of there. James Washington is, is not long for the Steelers either because they're not going to give him a second contract. He's he's I mean, a disappointment. That's what he large. signs for. I mean, he's listen. Someone will overpay him. He's been productive enough when given the opportunity. Yeah. He has the pedigree with the bullet and the cough. Like they're going to try and pay him wide receivers. Free. The Pittsburgh Steelers don't want to pay wide receivers. So what, what are they going to pay him? Yeah, they're going to give him a one year deal or a two year incentive laden deal. Like someone else will give him more money elsewhere. I think whenever his deal's up, he might have one more year. But Juju sure should go on next year. But one of these teams will lose because there will not be another tie in the NFL this year. So who is undefeated after this week? Pittsburgh or Tennessee? Pittsburgh. I'm gonna go no doubt in my mind. I'm going to go with Tennessee at home. Moving on to a division battle of the surprising 3-3 three and three Carolina Panthers heading to the Mercedes-Benz Superdome to battle with ragarm Drew Brees. And slant boy Michael Thomas with those New Orleans Saints coming off of their bye. So, yeah, Tom, when Thomas, Thomas isn't punching one of my favorite defensive players in the league, should be back this week. Do you think okay, anyone uh, named Chauncey should just get punched randomly? Sounds like a very punchable name. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a fair assessment. Punchable. Right. Um, but I do love the guy. Uh, however... Yeah, Michael Thomas is back. This offense is totally different when he's there. Drew Brees is going to force feed him. I, I have Thomas in a few spots. Cannot wait to plug him back in, especially against this Carolina defense, even though it's softer against the run. Uh, against wide receivers, they have given up. Where am I here? Carolina, Carolina. Doing this exciting live breakdown. On the fly. Well, I will tell you, it's not against wide receivers, but against pass catchers, they have only given up 6.1 yards per attempt in the passing game. Ooh, I found game. it. 17.1 fantasy points to wide receivers, which is the fourth least. Yeah, I was going to say. That's, that's <laughs> Defensively, the fourth best. Yeah, they're limiting pass catchers. Yeah, so they're – they're. I, do you, I always wonder this sometimes, uh, to go off on a tangent here. So – I wonder if they limit pass catchers or teams just know how shitty they are against the run that they don't even pass that much because they're the sixth worst against the run. Fantasy running backs are scoring 24.5 points a game against them. So I, I never know if they're – do you know what I'm saying? Like are, are they really bad against the pass or do teams go, they're so bad at the run, what's the point of even ex- passing the ball on them a ton? Yeah, I mean, just doing some quick box score scouting here. They're, they're weak so far. In week one, they played the Raiders, and that was when uh, Jacobs ran for three touchdowns off them. Derek Carr only threw it 30 times for 239 yards. They played the Bucks, lost in, in week two, and we all know what happened in that game. It was the – I called my shot Leonard Fournette 100 yards and two touchdown game. And Ronald Jones also ran for touchdowns. So back-to-back weeks, they gave up three touchdowns. Then they played the Chargers in week three. Those Chargers, they – Herbert threw all over him, 330, one and one. I think that might have been the game Eckler got hurt because he led them with 59 yards and a touchdown, so not as effective rushing the ball. Then they had the Cardinals in week four. Kyler Murray only threw for 133 yards, but they that's they, the Panthers beat them. And Kenyon Drake had a stinker in 13 for 35. So a little bit of a mixed bag because there's – and then they got the Falcons in week five, which I think was a julio list game, if I'm not mistaken. Gurley got him for 121 and one, so – yeah, there was a little bit of a mixed bag there in who they played against and what people were able to do. Teams largely can run on Carolina. I do believe that we're going to see a lot of that with uh, Alvin Kamara and Latavius Murray in this one. But uh, it, with my stat of the, the Carolina pass defense allowing a measly 6.1 yards for attempt, I say good thing Drew Brees doesn't throw a pass six yards anymore. So it's going to fit right into <laughs> this game plan for, I said, Slant Boy and AK all day. We're just going to see the potential wide receiver one and RB one in the same game here. 
we do get at least from what I saw one more week of Mike Davis. Uh, I don't know what yeah. Chris McCaffrey's is. I, I know that he will not be playing this week. So while it, I don't think it'll be through the ground because the Saints run defense is pretty stout. There's, it's just he's getting six plus catches in the game. It's it's just all but guaranteed. He should get a hundred all purpose. He's as likely to score a touchdown as just about any running back in the league, not named Derrick Henry right now. So uh, you're going to fire up Mike Davis. Hopefully a shootout breaks out, and Robbie Anderson and my boy DJ Moore can keep pace. Because who's going? Who is Marshawn Lattimore going to go to? Is it going to be to the field stretcher in their offense now? Is DJ Moore? Is it going to be to the guy that gets the volume largely in the underneath stuff in Robbie Anderson? I think Lattimore is going to be on DJ Moore. Maybe he doesn't have a shadow anybody. Maybe just just sticks to his side of the field. Well, he hasn't been locked down either, so it's not like roads closed with uh, Marshall and Lattimore. But hopefully, we we get into a firefight and ex Saint Teddy Bridgewater catches some feelings going back to that Superdome and slings it around dueling with Drew Brees and uh, tries to hand them a loss. I don't think the Saints are bulletproof. They will win this game, but I think Carolina's going to be able to score on them. If, if you're desperate in a GPP for, for fantasy here for DFS, I don't mind the Teddy Bridgewater, Ian Thomas, complete sleeper stack here. You know, the Saints have given up the most fantasy points, tight end, 14.9 per game. So Ian Thomas has been – a ghost would be generous. He fucking completely invisible. That guy's disappeared, which breaks our heart here at the 40, one of our right. favorites. So I, I think this is a good spot for him to finally get in the end zone, maybe get some work here. You were talking about Lattimore shutting down one of the wide receivers. If we take one of the wide receivers out of the game, then it's the other wide receiver and could be Ian Thomas. So I, I, I like Ian Thomas here as a sneaky, make a bold prediction. Tight end one week out of nowhere from him. I think Teddy has a good game against his defense, too, as the Saints are giving up 23.9 to opposing quarterbacks. So I, I think there's going to be some sneaky points from Carolina, but I do think the Saints beat the shit out of them at home. Oh, I oh, I, I, I need an Ian Thomas day in my life. Because it's, too. <laughs> it's, it's unexplainable. It's just not a function of their offense. Uh, they don't ever talk bad about the guy. He's just never involved. He gets, like, at most two targets a game. Because they're too busy just force feeding Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore and running back, Mike. whoever that is, the ball. So, moving on to the last one o'clock game, it should be interesting. The Buffalo Bills four and two, just uh, since they got their asses handed to them, but they just didn't look like they were in the same caliber of team as the Kansas City Chiefs on the early Monday Night Football game. They get to head to Murder Life Stadium to <laughs> duel. With the 0-6 New York Jets, I don't know if Flacco is starting again. Not that it matters. It doesn't um, matter. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter whatsoever. But somehow Adam Gase is currently employed going into week six. Uh, or sorry, going into week seven, almost the, the NFL midpoint by those New York Jets. Yeah. So Buffalo's projected for 29, and the Jets are projected for 16. They're not even touching that 16. I'm going to make the call for the back-to-back shutouts. <laughs> it would not be surprising not here. The Jets are listless. And their pass defense is allowing 8.1 yards per attempt. So I just said the Stephon Diggs and Smokey Brown just streaking down the field, catching bombs from Josh Allen in a huge get-right game from these Buffalo Bills. Um Josh Allen could be the quarterback one this week. I think when he played the Jets last, we we called for the uh, maybe that was the Dolphins. But this is setting up as a as a another get right spot. We said a get right spot for those Packers early on. I think this is a get right spot for the for the Buffalo Bills. And uh, as far as their running game is concerned, the, we we saw Zach Moss come back and he handled. Five of the ten, no, sorry, five of the fifteen non-Josh Allen carries. So it was only ten carries by Singletary. He didn't do much with him himself. Only thirty-two yards. Zach Moss had five for ten for only two yards per clip. And the Chiefs aren't a stout run defense. They just could not get anything going um, in this game uh, against the Chiefs. So they're, they're, all will be right with the world again as, as they head down to MetLife Stadium to bludgeon the Jets. I'm going to say Josh Allen is responsible for four touchdowns on the day, whether it be rushing or receiving. 
Stephon Diggs is catching at least one of them. John Brown's getting one. Probably a passing touchdown to a random tight end, not named Dawson, Dawson Knox, because he's not allowed to, to start. So it'll be Tyler Croft or it'll be Lee Smith randomly. But the Bills are just, yeah, 35 to 3 in this one. Bills by murder. But also, whoever the quarterback is, Jameson Crowder still finds a way to yeah, maintain yeah. relevancy, even in blowouts. Wasn't the high end performance that you that he had come to expect in, in recent uh, weeks from Crowder, but you're still firing him right back out there in PPR leagues. He should be a lock to catch six plus passes in this game. Yeah, play all your bills. Do not play a single. Well, I guess Crowder. Other than Crowder, <laughs> you can't put his jet your lineup and feel good. No, you can't. I mean, they, they got rid of Le'Veon Bell, and what did that yield? 11 carries for 46 yards from Gore, which kudos to him for churning out a re- respectable yards per carry <laughs> average. But Michael P. Ryan, you know, 6 for 26, another four points free. So they were pretty effective, you know, running the ball. Tyler Johnson shot out of a cannon, though. Uh, the ex-Detroit Lions, 3 for 42? Hmm. Might want to keep an eye on Tyler Johnson bringing a little spark to that running game, but not this week because they're going to have to throw it all day, whether it be Flacco slinging it 44 times like he did against the Dolphins or if Darnold comes back. It doesn't matter. It's, yeah, it's Jamison Crowder or bust for these Jets. Out of one o'clock. For the Fantasy 40, I'm John Debari, my co-host Matt Walker, MIA, Mr. Andrew Burke, and we are out of here. Ow! (laughs) All right. Good night, Chop down this monster. Rod.